I have decided to resume our sequential exposition of the book of Galatians in three weeks. Now, I've decided to do this for two main reasons. First, I'll be out of the pulpit for the next two weeks. Next Sunday, Dr. Dave Dietz will be with us again. I'm looking forward to his message. And then the Sunday after that, Dr. Corey Marsh will be preaching. And the reason why I wanted to put off our sequential exposition to Galatians 3 is because we're, or we're jumping back into Galatians in chapter 3. We haven't been in Galatians since November. And in the middle of Galatians 3 is considered by many, myself included, one of the most difficult passages in the entire New Testament to interpret. There's also a very difficult passage in Galatians 4. So I didn't want to jump back into Galatians today and then jump back out for two weeks because that section of scripture is going to take us about three to four sermons to work through. And I wanted to make sure that we had enough space to work through it because it's going to be difficult, but very, very enriching and strengthening of our faith. The second reason is because the current events in Ukraine have... uh, kind of prompted me to want to encourage you to remember what matters in life. Here's a quote from a missionary in Ukraine. He wrote this asking for prayer before the invasion started. We have made some contingency plans because it seems like the wise thing to do. Like buying some non-perishable food, water, a propane stove, and packing bomb shelter backpacks, they are ready to go. But as Christians, we are not here to survive. We are here to love the Lord with all of our hearts and joyously give everything we got toward the fame of the Almighty. We are often wooed in Orange County into focusing our lives on the wrong things. What's happening on the world stage is a good reminder for us to pray for our brothers and sisters around the world, but it is also a reminder to us that we should ask ourselves a question, what are we living for? That same missionary wrote yesterday, we are beginning our third night here in Kiev with periodic sirens and explosions, and they often come in clumps of several in a row, and then it stops for a while. The Lord is answering your prayers and he is protecting us. Praise him. Tonight, we have about 50 people from our church and approximately 15 or so unbelievers from the neighborhood using our church building as a refuge. There are several children and a couple of babies. This will be our third night sleeping on mats in our underground parking lot that we are using for a bomb shelter. Where do you go when your life falls apart? What strengthens you? Let's pray. Our Father and our God, as we now come to your word, we ask that you would encourage us. Lord, once again, lift our heights, our hearts to heights of joy. Remind us of your great love for us. And we pray that you would strengthen us to live for you and to live for you alone. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Our text for this morning is 1 Peter chapter 1. And we're really just going to be looking at verse 2 in one word or two words from verse 1. But would you please turn, if you're not already there, to 1 Peter chapter 1 beginning in verse 1 and follow along as I read. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who reside as aliens, scattered throughout Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, who are chosen, according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, by the sanctifying work of the Spirit, to obey Jesus Christ and be sprinkled with his blood. May grace and peace be yours in the fullest measure. Horatio Spafford was an attorney in Chicago 
And an elder of his church, who was noted for his Christian character and his many deeds of kindness to those in want. His family was taking a vacation in Europe, but he was delayed because of his business, and he sent his wife and his four children ahead on a French ocean liner. In the blackness of a November night in 1873, the steamship collided with another ship. And in 12 minutes, the ship that Spafford's wife and four children were on went down, carrying with it 230 souls. Mrs. Spafford sank with the ship, but was rescued. But unfortunately, Spafford's four daughters died. When his wife was ashore, she sent a message to her husband in Chicago. And the message simply said this, saved, but saved alone. What shall I do? Mr. Spafford left Europe and returned with her to Chicago. In his great sorrow, there came from his heart a song to trust in God for his care. That song is called, It Is Well With My Soul. He wrote these words, When peace like a river attendeth my way, when sorrow like sea billows roll, whatever my lot, thou hast taught me to say, it is well, it is well with my soul. This morning, we're going to once again turn our attention to the letter of 1 Peter to peer into the truth that leads us to say, whatever my lot, thou hast taught me to say, it is well with my soul. And that truth is the doctrine of election. Now, the word election comes from the Greek word that is translated into chosen in verse 1. Notice verse 1 of 1 Peter chapter 1. Peter is writing to those who are, at the end of verse 1, who are chosen. The Greek adjective is electos. And it means to be elected or selected. Here we find Peter beginning his letter with an incredible encouragement. You're chosen. And although we'll look at this in more detail later in the sermon, it's important to understand the context in which Peter says this. That word chosen modifies the word aliens. Notice in verse 1, those who reside as aliens. That word aliens, it refers to the world's rejection of Christians. Peter, in a sense, begins this epistle by saying, the world doesn't want you, but God does. Unfortunately, today, the doctrine of election is often under assault, and people rejecting the idea that God chooses those who are his. But when we reject that idea, what hope are we left with? If we live in a world that sees us as aliens who don't belong here, and we see ourselves as those who don't belong here because we're citizens of another kingdom. It's so important to understand that God wants us. No matter what you have going on in your life today, no matter what happens to America in the future, no matter what happens to our brothers and sisters in Ukraine, they are God's. And it is well with their soul. And if you have placed your faith in Christ, it doesn't matter whatever your lot. It is well with your soul. He has chosen you. The doctrine of election is pervasive in Scripture. Let me just wash you with several texts. Matthew 24, 24 says, For false Christs and false prophets will arise 
and show great signs and wonders so as to mislead, if possible, even the elect. False teachers cannot mislead the elect. Luke 18.7 says, Now will not God bring about justice for his elect who cry out day and night? And will he delay long over them? Paul said in Ephesians 1.4, Just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, so that we would be holy and blameless before him in love. Again in Colossians, Paul says, As those who have been chosen of God, holy beloved, put on a heart of compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Notice that our compassion and kindness and humility and gentleness and patience is linked to our understanding of election in that text. Paul said to Timothy in 2 Timothy 2.10, for this reason I endure all things, listen to this, for the sake of those who are chosen. We talked about this when we talked about the value of our people a couple of weeks ago. Paul said that he endured all sake for everything for the sake of the chosen. Now, the doctrine of election is easy to understand. God chooses us to be saved. But it is hard to accept. It's hard to accept, I think, for two main reasons. First, we have an inflated view of ourselves and we want to take credit for some aspect of our salvation. But second, this is the emotive reality of it, we struggle with its implications. Because when we start down the road of God chose me, the immediate next thought is usually, what about my aunt or uncle? What about my brother and sister? What about my mom and dad? Now, it's important to understand that Scripture doesn't answer for us that question. In fact, it allows that mystery to remain. But the doctrine of election is used in Scripture to comfort believers. You got to understand that. The reason why God has invited us into this aspect of his saving work is because he wants us to be comforted by the reality that he chose us not based on any foreseen thing that we would do in the future, but solely as an act of his kindness, love, and grace. It's kind of like, uh, this is an, an analogy that falls short. But it's kind of like me saying to my wife, I love you and I'm committed to you. Not because of what you do or do not do, but I just simply love you, Allison. That's God toward his people. I have a lot to say this morning, but I'd like just to take you to a passage of scripture that I think is helpful. If you struggle with the doctrine of election, You're in good company because the Apostle Paul struggled with it. Turn to Romans chapter 9. And there's so much that could be said here. Really, this whole chapter deals with election. But in Romans 9, Paul says something very, very interesting to me. Beginning in verse 1, he says, I am telling the truth in Christ. I am not lying. My conscience testifies with me in the Holy Spirit. And then notice verse 2. This is very interesting. That I have great sorrow and unceasing grief in my heart. Okay, Paul, why, why do you have sorrow? Well, look at verse 3. For I could wish that I myself were accursed separated from Christ for the sake of my brethren, the kinsmen, my kinsmen, according to the flesh, who are Israelites, to whom belongs the adoption of sons and the glory and the covenants and the giving of the law and the temple service and the promises. Jump to verse six, but it is not as though the word of God has failed, for they are not all Israel who are descendants from Israel. 
Now, there are some interpretive difficulties there. We will actually deal with uh, something relating to this passage, particularly verse 6, when we get back into the book of Galatians. But the point that I want you to see is that Paul is saying, I have sorrow in my heart because my kinsmen, according to the flesh, are not in Christ. I wish that I could give, Paul says, my own salvation. I wish that I myself could be accursed so that they could be saved. In other words, Paul's saying there is absolutely nothing I can do to save them. And he goes on and to flush out the doctrine of election. Notice verse 12. Speaking of Esau and Jacob, the older will serve the younger, just as it was written, Jacob I love, but Esau I hated. What shall we say then? Is there, it, there is no injustice with God, is there? May it never be. For he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. So then it does not depend on the man who wills, nor on the man who runs, but on God who has mercy. Now that word hated, it's a Hebraism, and it means to love less. Probably here what's being stated is not so much in view that God hated Esau, but that he rather chose one, um, meaning Jacob, Israel, for divine blessing, and then another nation, Edom, he left for divine judgment. The doctrine of election has an emotive component as we wrestle through it. But it's important not to deny the doctrine of election when you start thinking about the what ifs. Paul contemplated the what ifs as it related to the nation of Israel and the doctrine of election. However, he did not abandon the doctrine of election and it was something that he held to very closely, particularly because of the great comfort that had brought him. And that's what Peter's going after in 1 Peter. Turn back to 1 Peter with me. Peter is highlighting the doctrine of election, not to be controversial, but to encourage a group of people that have been exiled from their land and are scattered throughout modern day Turkey. Although the doctrine of election is difficult to understand, we must accept it for three main reasons. Number one, it explodes our view of grace. When God saves a person, we're thankful for what we begin to understand Christ has done. He came down out of heaven, died upon a cross to save us from the wrath that we deserve from denying God. But as we begin to dig into scripture, we come across this word chose, chosen, elected, and we begin to understand that what we once thought was grace was very small as God explodes our view of grace when we begin to discover that we were actually chosen before the foundation of the world. And the reason we're saved is not simply because we put our faith in Christ, it's because God was working to save us before we ever believed. The doctrine of election must be accepted if your view of God's grace is going to grow. But it also must be accepted for the purpose of what Peter lays it out here is that it comforts us in times of suffering. And thirdly, it maximizes God's glory. I have three points for you this morning. Let me give those to you up front. First, we're going to note, all from verse 2, the reason of God's choice. The reason of God's choice. Second, the realization of God's choice. The realization of God's choice. And third, the results of God's choice. The results of God's choice. Now, before we jump into our message, let me just give you a preliminary observation. Notice in verse 2 that there are three prepositional phrases. Notice, number one, first prepositional phrase, according to the foreknowledge of God and Father, one. Second prepositional phrase, by the sanctifying work of the Spirit, two. Three, to obey Jesus Christ and be sprinkled with his blood. Verse two separates easily into three prepositional phrases. Now, why this is important is because in Greek, there is a main noun 
or verb that governs the prepositional phrases. And that is the word chosen in verse one. Peter says, I'm writing to those who reside as aliens. I'm writing to those who the world doesn't want, knowing that God has chosen you. And then Peter says three things about those who are chosen. Point number one, the reason for God's choice. The reason for God's choice. Notice verse two, according to the foreknowledge of God the Father. This prepositional phrase tells us the reason why we are chosen. What is the basis of God's election? Answer, it's because you're so awesome. I love it. I just got dirty looks. Good. You know, you are a wretch. You deserve the righteous judgment of God for your sin. God did not choose you because he looks at you and thinks, man, I made them all. But that one, that one is especially good. God chooses the weak things of the world to confound the wise. There are not many wise among us, Paul says in 1 Corinthians. We are not in Christ because God saw that we were better than everyone else in the world. We are in Christ simply because of God's great love. Notice the word foreknowledge. Do you see that word? This is the Greek noun prognosis. Sound familiar? It's where we get our English word prognosis. It's used seven times in the New Testament. Five times in verb form and two times in noun form. This is one of the noun forms. That's going to become important in a minute. In this context, one Greek lexicon defines it as to know before a particular temporal reference. Now this word prognosis can be taken in two ways. First, it can be used chronologically, meaning to have foreknowledge can mean to know information about something before it happens. And it is used two times in that way in verb form in the New Testament. But it can also refer to not just knowing that something will happen in the future, meaning foreknowledge of something that's coming, but it also is used to talk about foreknowledge of relationship. For example, this word is used in Romans eleven twelve when God said, or Paul says, God has not rejected his people whom he foreknew. Or do you not know that scripture says in the passage about Elijah, how he pleads with God against Israel. Now in the Septuagint, which is the Greek translation of the Old Testament that was around during the time of Christ, this word prognosis or prognosco is used to describe intimate human relationships between people. For example, in Genesis 4:11, we read, "Now Adam knew his wife Eve, and she conceived and bore Cain." This word prognosis is where we get our English phrase carnal knowledge, which is what's used here in Genesis 4:1 talks about an intimate human relationship where a husband and wife know one another. It's used relationally as well in the Septuagint in Jeremiah 1.5. Before I formed you in the womb, I, what? Knew you. I didn't know something you would do in the future, but I actually relationally, personally, God says, knew you before I formed you. Now the question is, how does Peter use this word foreknowledge? Again, notice the text. We are chosen according to the foreknowledge of God. So does Peter use it chronologically, meaning we are chosen because God looks down the corridor of time and sees us doing something and then makes a choice of us? Or is Peter using this word to reference relational knowledge? Well, the answer is he uses it to refer to relational knowledge. This describes God's prior knowledge of his people that is not affected by independent human choices, but by his sovereign grace. 
God chose to have a relationship with some individuals based on his eternal plan. Now, it's clear that we are to take this word foreknowledge relationally for three reasons. Can I just nail this coffin shut today? All right, here we go. How do we know where to take this word foreknowledge grammatically, not chronologically, but relationally? Number one, let me give you three reasons. Number one, the context. The context. Again, notice the word aliens in verse one. Parapetamos is the word. And it refers to staying for a while in a strange or foreign place, sojourning or residing temporarily. It describes a Christian's relationship to the world. Now the word chosen, as I said earlier, modifies the term parapetamos or the term aliens. So we can translate that word aliens as elect aliens. Contextually, those two words used in verse one go together and they cannot be grammatically separated in the context of the passage. So we don't just say they're aliens or we rather as Christians are aliens but rather we are chosen or elect aliens. Secondly is the grammar. The word foreknowledge that's used here is a noun, not a verb. Okay, help me out here, English students. You're like, Ryan, I did not come this morning brushing up on my 10th grade English. What's the difference between a verb and a noun? A verb is a action. A noun is a person, place, or what? This word that's being used here, prognosis, it's not a verb. It's not describing something God does, but something that is. A person, place, or thing. It's a noun. He chose us, notice verse 2, according to, not an action of God, but a reality that exists within God himself. The grammar here tells us that this has to be taken relationally, not uh, chronologically, because it's not something God does, meaning looking down the corridor of time and choosing us based on something that he foresees, that's an action, but it's something that is rooted in the person of God. He has foreknowledge of us in a relational way. To say it another way, Peter is not saying that God knows beforehand what aliens will do, but that God knows beforehand the aliens themselves. The foreknowledge of God involves God's favorable disposition to certain people before they existed. Now, third, Peter's usage of the word in other places. What we can do is we can look at everything Peter wrote in the New Testament and we can ask the question, how does Peter use this word in a general sense? So we looked at the grammar of the verb, or I'm sorry, the noun. We looked at the context of the passage, but we can also branch out a little bit and just ask the question, how does Peter typically use this word? Now, everyone in this room has phrases that they like to use. You know how I know who's hanging out with who? Because when you hang out with different people in the church, your phrases change. Pastor Ben, he always calls me buddy. When people hang out with Pastor Ben and they start calling me buddy, I know, Ben doesn't have to, they don't have to tell me they hung out with Ben. I know they hung out with Ben. See, because what happens is we start to take on each other's vernacular, don't we? Because we tend to use the same words in the same way in the different places that we're at, right? So this is not a stretch to say, how did Peter use this word? What was it at cust- Peter's custom to how to use it? Well, the answer is every time in the New Testament that Peter uses this word, foreknowledge, he uses it to refer to intimate knowledge, not understanding of what will happen in the future. Does that make sense? Let me just take you to two places. You don't have to turn there. I'll read them to you first. Actually, you're in 1 Peter. Just look down at verse 10. 1 Peter 1.10. Speaking of Christ, not the recipients of this letter, Peter says, for he was what? Foreknown before the foundation of the world, but has appeared in these last times for your sake. 
He's not saying that God knew that Jesus would come based on a a chronology of events. He's saying that Jesus was himself foreknown in prior relationship with God before the foundation of the world. But he has appeared in these last times for your sake. Then in Acts 2.23, Peter, as he's preaching the first sermon uh, that bursts the church in Jerusalem, he says, this man, speaking of Christ, delivered over to you by the predetermined plan and foreknowledge of God, you nailed to a cross at the hands of godless men and put him to death. Does that make sense? Peter's use of this word in other places also affirms that his idea of foreknowledge is intimate relationship. Let me give you some application. Christian, listen. God did not choose you because he knew facts about you. He chose you because he decided to set his electing love on you. His love for you is not rooted in the strength of your love for him. It is rooted in his choice to set his love on you before the foundation of the world, as Paul says in Ephesians 1. Understanding his choice of you during this time of history will remind you that no matter what happens, his love remains on you. And your heavenly inheritance is guaranteed. Notice verse four. Paul speaking of the elect, to, or Peter speaking of the elect to obtain an inheritance which is imperishable and undefiled and will not fade away reserved in heaven for you. Listen, the reason why God chose you is not because of you. And that is awesome news. Vody Bauckham said it this, said it this way. If I could lose, or I'm sorry, John MacArthur said this. If I could lose my salvation, I would lose it. Can I get an amen? amen? And if you don't think that, you have a pride problem, come and talk to one of the elders after the service, all right? Thank God that he is not fickle like we are fickle. But he sets his love on us And we can be sure that he loves us because it is rooted in his character and who he is and not in who we are. No matter what happens, he loves us. Point number two, the realization of this choice. So the question becomes, how do I know I'm chosen? At what point... Does his choice of me become a reality? Well, in Ephesians 1.4, as we already read, he chose us in him before the what? Foundations of the world. But there is a point in time that we become conscious of his choice of us. Notice what Peter says. According to the foreknowledge of God, by the way, election is a Trinitarian work. Peter mentions the Father, the Spirit, and the Son in verse 2. All three members of the Godhead or persons of the Godhead are involved in our election. By the foreknowledge of God, second prepositional phrase, by the sanctifying work of the what? Spirit. Spirit. The second prepositional phrase describes when God's choice of us becomes a reality. God chose us in eternity past, but it is realized when the Holy Spirit sanctifies us. Do you see the word sanctification? This noun means to be set apart or to make holy, to sanctify or to consecrate. Now sanctification is both positional and progressive in the New Testament. We've covered this before. You should be reminded that positional sanctification occurs at our conversion for all intents and purposes. The moment that we are converted, we are set apart. We're running after sin. We're running after hell. We're running after our own lust, our own desires, our own wants. God in his mercy and grace grants us the new birth. We are regenerate and we respond in by placing our faith in Christ. As that occurs, 
We are set apart. Now, it doesn't happen chronology, chr- chronologically. It happens all at once. Reformed theologians call this the ordu salutis. We can talk about that at another time. But it's a component of our salvation that upon our conversion, Christ sets us apart unto himself. We repent. We turn from the world. We turn from our way of thinking. We turn from trusting in ourselves. We turn from our lust and we place our faith in Jesus Christ. To say it in a Bible way, we're sanctified. We're set apart. 1 Corinthians 1.12 says, Paul wrote to the church of Corinthians and said, to the church of God, which is in Corinth, to those who have been sanctified in Christ, have been sanctified. That's past tense. If you're a Christian, you have been sanctified. So you are positionally set apart, have been, past tense, but there is a progressive reality to your sanctification where you are continually growing in Christ, continually being separated from the world, the flesh, and the devil. Progressive sanctification, you can find in places like 1 Thessalonians 4.13. For this is the will of God, your sanctification. That is that you abstain from sexual immorality. That's an ongoing reality. We are sanctified, according to this passage, by the Holy Spirit. By the sanctifying work of the Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the agent of your conversion. By the way, the word saint comes from the same Greek word, hagiazo, to sanctify. When the New Testament calls Christians saints, it literally means the separated ones, the sanctified ones. We're separated unto God. Now, how does this occur? By the Spirit. You don't separate yourself. You can't. That's how sinful you are. You're like, I want to follow Jesus. I want to follow Jesus. I want to follow Jesus. But I really like this over here. By the way, this is why Paul, this is where we're going to get to in Galatians. Come back in three weeks. Well, come back next week too, but we are not. Paul says, did you begin in the spirit, but now you are being sanctified by the law. We are sanctified not by the law. We are sanctified by the work of the spirit. But what happens is we come to Christ as the spirit births us, but because we are so hopelessly legalistic, we go back to the law and we try to progress by the law rather than being filled and under the control of the Holy Spirit. We'll get there. Come back as we get back into Galatians. We're sanctified by the spirit. Jesus says this when he talks to Nicodemus in John 3, about the new birth and regeneration. Nicodemus goes to him at night and says, hey, uh, how, does a, how can I have eternal life? And Jesus says, you must be born again. You must be born from above. And Jesus goes on to explain this. And he says in chapter three, verse eight of John, the wind blows where it wishes. You hear the sound of it, but you don't know where it comes from or where it's going. So is everyone who is born of the spirit. You can see the effects of the wind but you don't see the wind itself. You can see the, ex- the effect of the new birth in the life of a Christian, although you're not, you don't actually view the birth itself. On this topic of sanctification, it's important for us to understand that the purpose of sanctification is not an end in itself. I know I've said a lot in shotgun fashion about sanctification, but this is an important point. Follow me here. To be sanctified is not an end in itself. It's not, the point of sanctification is not simply to be separated from the world, the flesh, and the devil. And the reason why this this is such an important point is because licentious Christians or false teachers accuse believers that are passionate about personal holiness as being what? Legalistic. That is just such a lie from the pit of hell. Legalism, the technical definition, is to find salvation by the law. It is not legalistic. The definition doesn't even fit to pursue personal holiness. But why do some people say that? Because there are certain Christian groups that see or act like sanctification is an end in itself. So they're really, really concerned with separation, which we are as a church. But let's make it clear that we're not concerned about separation as an end in itself. 
we're concerned about separation as a beginning to a healthy relationship with God. You cannot walk with God when you love the world. Paul Washer said it this way in his book, The Gospel Call and True Conversion. One of the first noticeable results of true conversion is biblical separation from the world, which is a gradual divorce or withdrawing from all that is displeasing to God, but in opposition and in opposition to his will. Such a separation, listen to this, is not an end in itself, but rather it is the first essential step to a greater end, drawing nigh unto God and giving ourselves to his purposes and his will. Does that make sense? Walking in the world's ways and walking with Jesus Christ are in complete opposition to each other. We're not about sanctification at Revolve Bible Church just for the fact of being weirdos who are separated from the world. We're all about sanctification at Revolve Bible Church because we're all about walking with Jesus Christ. You see the importance? We need to make sure that as we think about our sanctification, we're not thinking about it as an end in ourselves. When we come to Christ, we are positionally separated by the Holy Spirit, but we are progressively being sanctified. And the reason we are being progressively sanctified, listen, is because we love and want Jesus Christ. And you know what the quickest route to sanctification is? We don't have time for this. I know I'm mumbling. I just wish I could go through the whole book of Peter again. Suffering. Pray for the church in Ukraine but you know what's happening right now? God is purifying it. Because all the worldly comfort they had is gone. When God brings suffering into your life, hear me, it's to sanctify you. It's to separate you from all the stuff you were pursuing. Because he wants you to have a greater pleasure. Christ, and he brings suffering into your life, not to be punitive, Christian. There is no more wrath for you. You are in Christ. The wrath of God does not abide on you. But the reason our lives go wonky is because we love the wrong things. But when you begin to suffer, and this is why scripture and Peter gets into this issue. Thank God for trials. Jump down to verse five. Verse seven. Verse six. (laughs) In this you greatly rejoice even now for a little while if necessary. You have been distressed by various what? So that, why are you distressed? Why are God's chosen ones distressed by various trials? Answer, to prove that your faith is real. So that the proof of your faith being more precious than what? But oh, how we just love gold over the proof of our faith. How we love comfort and ease above a proven faith. But God in his great love brings frowning providence into our lives and that although our faith is tested by fire, it may be found to result in the praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. We realize that we're chosen when the Spirit sets us apart. Can I ask you a question? Are you wrestling with whether or not God has chosen you? How do we answer that? Let me give you one way. You're suffering. And in the midst of your suffering, you're finding Christ sweeter than what the world has to offer. You're chosen. You're chosen. But if you begin to suffer and the taste of the world is not being wiped out of your mouth, something's wrong. 
Because for all God's chosen ones, he uses suffering to conform us to the image of Christ and to increase our affection for him. No one likes suffering, but it is God's tool to accomplish his purpose. Pray for Ukraine. Oh, but pray that they would enjoy Christ more and that they would be a light to all of Europe and to the world. As we look to Ukraine right now, it makes me think, what is God doing in the church in Ukraine? What plans does he have for her in the future? How many missionaries will be sent from Ukraine to America to tell America to place their unwavering faith in Jesus Christ? Thirdly, the result of God's choice. The result of God's choice. What happens? What happens when we're chosen? Notice verse two. According to the foreknowledge of God the Father by the sanctifying work of the Spirit, here it is, to obey Jesus Christ and be sanctified by his blood. Oh, before I was sanctified, I hated the word obedience. Come on, so did you. You're like, I still do. I'm with you, I struggle with that too. But as he sets us apart, something happens. Jesus becomes the Lord of our life. And it's no longer about me as much as it's about him. The result of being chosen is obedience. From time to time when people worry or wonder about how do they know if they're chosen, number one, how are you responding to suffering? Number two, are you obedient to Jesus Christ? As Christians, we don't obey perfectly, but we do obey truly. 1 John 1, 1 through 8 says, if we say that we have no sin, we are deceiving ourselves and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Jesus warned that there will be many who claim to be saved that are not obedient. Speaking of false teachers, he said, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my father will enter. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name cast out demons and in your name perform many miracles and I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Peter is telling his readers here in this passage that true salvation has the observable evidence of holy behavior. Obedience to Christ doesn't just mean not doing the wrong thing. It also means doing the right thing. Sometimes, because we live in such a hedonistic society, we think that we're being obedient to Christ because I'm not doing the stuff that I used to do. Or I'm fighting to not do that thing. But obedience is not just not doing, it's also doing. Are you living for Christ? Are you telling your friends and family about Christ? Are you praying and interceding for people who don't know Christ? Are you giving yourself in service and sacrifice for the church or are you just a consumer here for yourself? When God sets a man or a woman apart, they begin to obey their Lord. Yes, we obey when he says, don't do that. But we also obey when he says, do that. Brother or sister, what is Jesus Christ telling you to do that you have not done? What do you need to do to please Jesus Christ? The spirit will tell you. But do not be deceived. Believers obey their Lord often at great personal cost. Not always, but often. 
Notice the phrase, to obey Jesus Christ and be sprinkled with his blood. Do you see that? This is an interesting statement. We're going to Bible geek out just for a minute here, okay? Peter uses this metaphor to describe what happens to Christians or happened to the Christians he's writing to. Now, this phrase, and be sprinkled with his blood, is used in three different ways in the Old Testament. Because remember, as we're reading this, Peter is writing to New Testament saints, but the only Bible they have at the time is the Old Testament. And so he's using words and phrases that would have been common to their understanding of Scripture. As New Testament believers in uh, the 21st century, we predominantly spent our time in the New Testament. In the first century, their time would have been spent in the Old Testament. So as we go back into the Old Testament, we see three references to this strange phrase, be sprinkled by blood. First, it was done to inaugurate the Mosaic Covenant in Genesis 24. Second, it was done to ordain priests. There would be a sacrifice and the priests would be sprinkled with blood. Third, it was done to cleanse a leper from sin. Now, I think that the reference here is to Exodus 24, 3 and 8, meaning it was to inaugurate a covenant. I was going to have you turn there, but we just don't have time. But the word covenant's a word we don't really use. We're going to get into this in Galatians. That's why I want to give us enough time because Paul is making the argument that the Mosaic covenant does not, super, or does not uh, overtake the Abrahamic covenant in Galatians 3. So we're going to unpack the idea of covenants quite a bit. But essentially a covenant is an agreement. And here in Exodus 24, there was an agreement between God and the Israelites. And God agreed to forgive the Israelites and the Israelites agreed to be obedient. And when that agreement was made, there was a sacrifice done and the blood of the sacrifice was sprinkled on the Israelites. So I think contextually here, when Peter says in verse two, and be sprinkled with his blood, I think the idea is that it's linked to obedience. God has saved you, but you have also agreed to be obedient. I think that's the idea that is used here with this, this phrase, be sprinkled with his blood. I have more to say, but for the sake of time, we need to land this plane. And I told you that I had three points, but I actually have four. The assurance of God's choice. We've given you several ways that you can know already that God has chosen you. But I want to ask you, how do you know? that God has chosen you. How do you know? Every time I preach on election, I get somebody coming up afterwards, and now I'm just going to include it in the sermon. People say things, they come up and they say, I'm not opposed to what you just said. I see it in the Bible. I believe God's chosen those who are his, but how do I know that I am chosen? And myself and pastors are often guilty of making it very difficult to know if you're chosen. I want to make it simple for you. Can I do that? I think the answer might surprise you. I want to take you to two passages, and we're going to do this quickly now, but turn to 1 Thessalonians 1. Paul, writing to the church in Thessalonica, in chapter 1, verse 4 says this, Knowing, beloved brethren, his choice of you. Did you catch that? Paul is saying to the church in Thessalonica, I know that God has chosen you. All right. Hold on. We need to stop then. If you want to know if God has chosen you, Paul, how did you know that God chose them? The answer is a lot more simple than you might think. Notice verse five and six. For our gospel did not come to you in word only. Here's the key, but also in power 
and in the Holy Spirit. And with full conviction, just as you know what kind of men we prove to be among you for your sake. The gospel was preached to them and it had three components in word, in power, and in conviction. You want to be an effective gospel preacher? You got to have those things. You got to have the right words. You got to have the power of the Spirit. And you got to do it with full conviction. You got to be convinced it's right. But notice what happened to the church in Thessalonica in verse 6. You also became imitators of us in the Lord, having received the word in much tribulation with the joy of the Holy Spirit. Here it is. You want to know how you know you know you're chosen? Because you received the word. You received the gospel. Now you're thinking right now, wait a minute, Ryan, it can't be that simple. It can't be that simple that I can know that I'm chosen simply because I've received the gospel. It's that simple. And you know why it's that simple? Because the gospel cannot be received apart from the work of the Holy Spirit. You cannot convince someone of the gospel intellectually. Paul knew that they were chosen because of the way they received the word. Turn to our next passage, 1 Corinthians. First Corinthians chapter two. In First Corinthians chapter two, let me give you a little context. This is very important to understand the book of First Corinthians as a whole. The church of Corinth was obsessed with Roman culture. Obsessed. And in Roman culture, it was all about self-promotion and avoiding shame. So worldliness went to church in the church of Corinth. This is why they were so obsessed with the sign gifts when you get to Corinthians 12, 13, and 14. It's because they, were, they, they thought that what was good and right was self-promotion and showing themselves as better than everybody. That's why they got obsessed with the gifts. Does that make sense? And they get obsessed with preachers who are more uh, or are better orators than other preachers because they are so, so obsessed with this outward sign of things. And so Paul, all through the book of 1 Corinthians, is confronting them and saying that the wisdom of the world, translation, the way your culture thinks about what's good and right is totally wrong. The wisdom of the world does not save, but it is the wisdom of God and he talks about the wisdom of God only being known if the spirit moves. That's why Paul obliterates all these weird practices in Corinth because they're drumming up all these practices in their flesh and Paul's saying to them, nothing's gonna happen if the spirit of God doesn't move. Look at verse, verse one of chapter two. And when I came to you, brethren, I did not come with superiority of speech or wisdom, proclaiming to you the testimony of God. That's Paul saying this because Corinth was obsessed with the superiority of speech and wisdom. And he's saying to you, hey, when I came, I wasn't obsessed with that stuff. Instead, I proclaim to you the testimony of God because I determined to know nothing among you except for Jesus Christ and him crucified. I didn't want to promote myself. I didn't want everybody to think that I was this wise guy. And I didn't want everybody to think that I had this great speech because you guys are all obsessed with that, Paul would say to the church of Corinth. The only thing I cared about was knowing that you were in Christ. Look at verse three. I was with you in weakness and fear. By the way, this list that Paul gives are all things that the church of Corinth looked down upon. Pfft, you're gonna listen to the apostle Paul. He makes tents. He's nothing special. Paul says, when I was there, I, I wasn't strong and I was really scared, not of you, but of God and with much trembling and my message and my preaching were not in persuasive words. Listen to how Corinth speaks to our age right now. Churches are being filled to go listen to guys who speak with what? 
persuasive words. Paul goes to Corinth and he actually makes a decision to not be persuasive in his wording and to not try to be a good orator. And he's doing all of this because he's assaulting the Corinthians and their value system. And notice what he says to them. But it was a demonstration of the spirit and power so that your faith would not rest on the wisdom of men, but on the power of God. Listen, you know how to know, you know how you know that a preacher's preaching in the power of the spirit? Because when you leave the room, you don't talk about the preacher. Because it wasn't about the way he put together the message or the eloquence of his words. But in that moment, the spirit of God actually changed your heart. And so you don't leave the room saying, I love that preacher. You leave that room saying, what a great savior. Paul's whole point here is that notice that to be saved is a demonstration of the Spirit's power. He goes on to flush this out in the rest of chapter two. The point is this, how do you know you're chosen? You accepted the gospel. And you know why you accepted the gospel? Because of the Holy Spirit. We get all spun up about whether or not we're chosen. And Paul says it so plainly in 1 Thessalonians 1.4. Knowing, brother, his choice of you. Because you accepted the gospel, not as words of men, but as Paul goes on to say in 1 Thessalonians, but as what it was, which is the word of God. If you're here and you've accepted the gospel of Jesus Christ, you can know that you're chosen. Not because you're perfect, not because you live a sinless life, but because God in his great mercy has seen it fit to open your eyes to the truth of the gospel. And remember that as you're witnessing to your friends and family. And you're getting, I get it, I've been there. We get frustrated. Why don't they get it? The answer, because the spirit of God has not yet sanctified them. That's why. But we pray that he will. Listen, leave here today fired up, not about the preacher, but about a great Savior who chose you, and he will never leave or forsake you. No matter what happens in our world, we have an inheritance reserved in heaven for us. Let us pray. Our Father and our God, we're we're thankful. How can it be that thou, my God, would die for me? How could it be that thou, my God, would choose me? How could it be that thou, my God, would sanctify me? How could it be that thou, my God, would let me obey Jesus Christ? Lord, as we reside as aliens and strangers in this world, we pray that you would help us to hold these truths so close. How amazing it is that you gave us these words from the Apostle Peter. It's so different than how we would approach our difficult moments. But Peter instructed the church to focus on who they were in you and not on their external circumstances. We pray that as a church, we would grow to be more focused on the truth of the gospel and less focus on our temporal circumstances. We know, Lord, your word tells us that our circumstances matter to you, that our physical lives matter to you. But we also know, Lord, that we can trust all of those things to you and have joy no matter what circumstance we're in because of your choice of us. We love you. We thank you for your word. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.